briefly, yeah, they did the Ecclestones, but the feedback was basically, we've seen these already. We get these on at the time it was sci-fi. Why are you showing it? Show us the stuff we can't get anywhere else. So now KBTC is pretty much classic Doctor Who. One the of only we, place for it. No, 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 only one of two places in the whole world that shows classic Doctor Who right now. The Sci-Fi Channel in Australia picked it up. Oh. <laughs> that's it, okay, so that's, that's local fandom. Um, wow. Like I said, I, I moved down and as much as I might, you know, I went to the wrestling cards, you know, it's like, this is not a competition thing. We're all one big happy Who family here. But I thought we needed, an, 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 to be fair, at the time, there was no new Doctor Who coming out written. So the rest of Society of the Wrestling Cards was showing other British shows, which is also fine. But I wanted an outlet for just showing Doctor Who. So I started the Emerald City Andrews. And we've been eating, as I said, for some time. And eating. <laughs> And eating. And eating, yes. It's a whole thing of the Emerald City Andrews. It's like if you're a couch potato, you want to be, you bring food, you eat someone else's food, you sit in front of a TV, you watch television. How bad is this? This is, we're, we're a fun bunch. Um, so I figured the place to start now is the very roots, the very beginnings of Doctor Who. How many, okay, so I know there's, the run ended not too long ago on KBTC. How many of you have seen William Hartnell as the Doctor? Ah, yes. the original, you might say. So yeah, so Doctor Who started in 1963. Um, little known trivia, well, trivia fact. This was the day after both John F. Kennedy and C.S. Lewis died. Uh, a lot of people bring up the C.S. Lewis thing because the TARDIS, let's face it, it is the wardrobe. <laughs> uh, it's just instead of going to Narnia, you end up going anywhere. So, <laughs> And it was, it was a way of bridging the gap between they had the sports shows in the afternoon and then they had like the music shows in the evening and they wanted something to keep the family audience and they, they came up, you know, as you, you know, this whole development thing just kept, kept they come all kinds of memos going across the BBC and stuff and they came up with this idea of, what about science fiction? What about, and they started looking at adapting um, classic short stories and stuff, and then eventually they developed this whole idea of this old guy in a police box and his granddaughter and the two teachers, and it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, so, I don't know, anything you guys want to say about Arnold? It was supposed to be mostly an educational series, and yeah. Sidney Newman, who was the head of BBC, had specifically said, no Buckeye monsters. <laughs> and he was actually quite upset when the Daleks uh, appeared. And arguably the Daleks are the one made Doctor Who. Yeah. And they, they were to Britain at that time what Star Wars was in the late 70s here. I mean, they were huge. And well, if, you, if you go back and look at the original, I don't know if you know this, most of you probably don't. There's a whole bunch of stories that just because there was no market for them, in the 70s, they jumped on it. They were gone, wiped, completely destroyed. No one had any idea that there would be, you know, hundreds of channels you could show these on, and there would be these little things you could put in a machine in front of your television that you could watch it again. So that, you know, they had no concept that this could happen. But if you go back and look at the whole complete lineup, especially that first season, it starts off with a, a historical story, a scientific story, a historical story, a scientific story, and they alternate it. So, you know, um, Marco Polo, the Aztecs, the Reign of Terror, they, you know, this has always been a part of the show is go back in history, but back then it was just let's observe history and see what's happening and be educational for the kids. Um, then, they, then they started throwing in more sci-fi elements and fewer and fewer guest appearances by historical figures and just began to show it is now. Another cool footnote about the Hartnell era is that its first producer, Verity Lambert, now keep in mind, this is 1963, a female producer. She's only 28 years old, but she kicked off this 50-year phenomenon. Back to and she, she was seriously challenged by the higher echelons of the BBC. They said, what in the world is she doing here? She didn't go to Eaton. She didn't chain smoke. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so anyway, but William Hartnell was already, he was already a well-established actor, but he was not the healthiest of any when the show started, and he just kept deteriorating. Finally, it came time to say, you know, and he, I don't know if, it, if he was pushed, if he decided to go, it's still kind of unclear, but, you know, he's, he was gone. So they said, well, do you like the show so much? Maybe we can keep it going a little bit longer. What if we recast him? 
Let's do something totally bizarre and different. Let's just get someone different. How about Patrick Trout? What do you think of him? Yeah. Patrick, Trout. Patrick Trout. He's so totally different from William Arnold. And Patrick Trout said, no, no, it will never last without with me. No, no. And he kept giving him more money. No, no. More money. No. More money. Okay. <laughs> Apparently within, and of course this, this is another story that's gone, his first story of course, if you're going to have a new, you know, totally recast the character, start with something big. They had the Daleks in his very first story. Power of the Daleks completely gone. Apparently all those viewers were start off, those kids behind the couch saying, oh no, 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 where is he? Where's our doctor? Where's our doctor? Within two episodes they're all going, William who? <laughs> And that's the, that's the worst part about all the junking is so much of Patrick Troughton's stories are missing and gone and completely. So, um, kept going. And now this was a time when the BBC was making the show year round. And man, think about this. They were making a half hour episode of Doctor Who every week. Um, you watch sometimes, there you will notice that the Doctor or one of the campaigns is an in for a couple of episodes. That's because they actually built in vacations into the shooting schedule. Um, but they were shooting it year round, and it was hard on everyone. Um, towards the end of Patrick Trout's run in the late 60s, however, they started thinking, how are we going to change, how are we going to make it easier on everyone? So they actually, there were several, a week or two gap between some of the stories in that last season. And they eventually decided, why do we have to go year round? Why don't we go half a year? We'll do 26 episodes a season. And Patrick Trout's going, great, great. Oh, by the way, I'm leaving. So, <laughs> And of course, of course, the BBC was doing this brand new thing. Color. <laughs> with the U. With the U. <laughs> uh, did I pronounce the U? Didn't you hear it? No, oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so, well, it worked before this movie again. Who are we going to cast? And they had a short list, and then they got this call from some guy's agent. Hey, hey, have you guys considered John Kirkley as the doctor? <laughs> Looked at the list. Wouldn't you know, he's the second name on the list. So apparently this is a meant to be. <laughs> Furby, anyone? Comments? He's mostly a comedian, and uh, this was kind of his first sort of serious part. He's mostly been doing radio, and they said, well, how do you want to play it? And, and I don't know, play yourself. He's like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, very much into gadgetry. This is true. But here's the thing, too. Uh, to save money, because they're in color, and let's say, you know, Doctor Who's always been an expensive show to make. So to save money, they said, let's exile the Doctor on Earth. <laughs> so we don't have to go out into space, and we don't have to build planet sets. Um, that lasted about a season. Um, but, but they created a certain intelligence agency, didn't they? Yes, they did. The United Nations Intelligence Task Force. That was actually great. They, because they knew this transition was coming up, they came up with it um, well, after Trump's last years. They introduced UNIT so that when John Kirby comes, um, that it's already established and it can make sense. So he was, his doctor was unit scientific advisor, uh, got to hang out with the Brigadier and Sergeant Benton and Captain Yates and Joe Grant, Joe Grant and Corporal Bell and anyone, anyone knows her? Obscure doctor who character from the seventies. okay, fine. Uh, <laughs> and like I said, last about season, because slowly he started making a few trips back out into space and um, and before long, he was out in space the whole time. So, unit, unit got dropped after about five years, but by this point, uh, John Kirby had also said, and yeah, so who are we going to cast? Who are we going to cast? Woo! Hey, there's this cool actor who's been Rasputin. How about him? He's, he's wacky enough. I don't know. Wasn't he also in one of the Sinbad movies? Yeah. And <laughs> hey, didn't we skip over Sarah Jane here? She got introduced in the last season of uh, John Kirby. He, yeah, she was the third companion that he had after Liz Shaw and Joe Grant. And the, you know, the problem is we have 50 minutes to talk about a show that's gone 50 years, um, and, we, and we want to give you guys a chance to bring up your things too. So we're trying we're trying to hit the highlights here. 50 years, 50 minutes, go. Okay. So, uh, Tom Baker. Tom Baker. I think more than any other actor who's played the Doctor it was the Doctor. He was that. He was like that. He is still like that in real life. Um, he's just this big, well, bigger than life, wild-eyed, bushy-haired guy, wears a long scarf. And it was the second, 
really a second resurrection for Doctor Who. It was, you know, the, the show was popular in Britain, but it kind of uh, done this. Well, then along comes Tom Baker and just shoots right up again, and everything, you know, and all the kids are watching it again, and they're playing Doctor Who on the playground again. Um, you know, I mean, he's a phenomenon, and he lasted seven years. And you know, a lot of people here might think, well, David Tennant was the doctor for a really long time. He's nothing. <laughs> After the first three seasons of Tom Baker, uh, Time Life bought the rights to it and began showing them here. And they decided that Americans wouldn't quite understand what was going on, and so they hired an actor named Howard De Silva to narrate them. And sometimes if you watch the episodes on PBS, you will hear this weird narration suddenly break in, like on Brain of Morbius's uh, and Underworld sometimes. Underworld sometimes, yeah. And that's what that was all about, because basically they were naming it for, to be on commercial stations. And so this guy would tell you what was going on, and they'd show clips and things like that. And eventually PBS got their hands on the original BBC versions. And, and not only that, they, they really, they, the Americans fans figured it out a lot quicker than they, anyone thought they would. So. <laughs> so, so, so by the time Tom Baker says, okay, that's it, I've had enough, I'm done, everyone said, wait, what? What do we do? Oh, oh, there have been other actors, right? Okay, so um, so this how about is, that wet vet on to all creatures, great and small? Don't forget, this is the '80s now. Okay, think, yeah. Um, John Nathan Turner, classic producer of the the entire '80s, longest serving producer of Doctor Who. He said, "Okay, well, who am I going?" He wrote down this list of things that basically weren't Tom Baker. Uh, See, so a little vulnerability, blah, 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 blah. and then the last thing he wrote down was straight. Hair. <laughs> <laughs> then I looked up his wall of actors. He had you know, a whole bunch of photos of actors on his wall, and thought, wait a minute, I wonder if Peter Davison would do it. Let me give him a call. Ring, ring. Um, Peter Davison was like probably the first person who could claim to have grown up with Doctor Who to play the part. He was 12 when the show started. Liked it from the start. Um, and he was a TV name. Okay. And he was already a TV name yeah. for guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was a well-established actor. Doesn't always happen that way. Doesn't usually happen that way. So, and he, it took him a while to, to say yes, but he eventually said, "Okay, yeah, I'll do it." And he was a very different doctor from a lot of the other ones. But you can see the little bits of all the other doctors in there at some point or another. So, um, that's Peter Davison. Any comments? Anyone? Yeah. Edward does. And then Edward died. Spoilers. Poor dinosaurs. Um. Then came probably by the uh, after Tom Baker left, they said he, the show had been on in Britain for um, on Saturdays for so long, and it was yeah it was it was starting to wane in the ratings. So they said let's try doing it during the week. So they showed it twice a day, twice a week during the week, and the ratings actually went up. But also a lot there was a lot of backlash. A lot of people were going no, you cannot take Doctor Who off Saturdays. Uh, when Peter Davison finally said enough, and um, they asked Colin Baker to do it, who this would have been pretty much the peak of the popularity here in America. Right. And during the 20th anniversary, Doctor Who was arguably pretty big here. There were articles in Time Magazine, uh, Entertainment Tonight actually did a feature on the uh, 20th anniversary convention in Chicago. Uh, most PBS stations in the country, except here, except were, uh, were showing this series, and it had quite a big fan base. That was 30 years ago. But this is in America. Over in Britain, is it was going down, and people were wearing it. Was it was like it'd been around for so long. I think people were just trying to take it for granted. And then, of course, Margaret Thatcher came along. Uh, she was she was not a big fan of the BBC. She wanted to, you know, want a lot of sort of like what they're doing now over there too, but uh, give it less emphasis. And some of the management of the BBC went along with it. And it was just there's lots of shake up at the BBC, and so after Colin Baker's first season, which by the way they went back to Saturday, but then they instead of having two 25 minute episodes during the week, they had one 45 minute episode. And this is a major change for the show. This is different. So it was only 13 weeks, but you got the same amount of show. Uh, then the BBC decided, you know what? I think it's time to try something different, and they took Doctor Who off the air for an extended break. Um, 18. Who, who remembers writing letters to the BBC saying, bring it back? Nobody? I didn't. Yeah, I, that was about the time I got into fandom. Oh, okay. I didn't feel it was in my place to actually write to the BBC at that time. I have a very nice response, actually. Oh, did you? A form letter. But. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, the song. 
Seriously? There was, oh yeah, there was, there was a charity single. I have it, yes, but I didn't think I was, was going to bring it up. <laughs> um, yeah, there's actually, you know, this is the era of Band-Aid and Live-Aid and um, USA for Africa, and a whole bunch of Doctor Who actors and singers in Britain got together and did a charity single to, to bring back the show. And, didn't do a lot of good. Oh, the, so, the, the music video was an extra on the Trial of the Time Lord DVD <laughs> box set. The, the British media is sort of interesting. They'll, they'll kick a show like like it's been on for a long time, but as soon as it gets canceled, they'll say, "Save the show!" Uh, and that, in fact, what happened with Doctor Who? Yeah. There's so much done the same thing. Yeah. So, but you know, but yeah, but here's the, but here's the thing to remember. This was really the first break there had ever been in Doctor Who since it had begun. This is over 20 years now. So, I you know back then it seemed like a crisis. Now after looking at what you know what happens now, it's like yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but came back. They said okay. Oh, we're gonna give you more episodes. So it was a 14 episode season. What they didn't what the, they didn't say though was they were going to be shorter episodes. They're going back to the 25 minutes. So Trial of the Time Lord, which was the new 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 series when it came back, because let's face it, the show was on trial, was a lot shorter than it had ever been before. And I'll be honest, you know, Trial of the Time Lord is great, but I'm not sure we had waited 18 months for this. It wasn't that great. But the show was, had new life. We said, let's continue on. And then uh, Michael Gray, the controller of the BBC, said, just not without Colin Baker. <laughs> what? What? He's the star of the show. What's wrong with him? It's like, just change him. So, is he a Dalek? <laughs> I do believe that Michael Grade in the 80s was a Dalek. <laughs> the, the good news is Michael Grade has come around and said, uh, yeah, I'm not sure it was the, that was the smartest thing I ever said. But um, anyway, so John Nathan Turner had no idea who to cast and saw, but a couple of agents approached him and said, hey, have you thought about this guy named Sylvester McCoy? <laughs> Went to see him in a show. He was doing a Pied Piper panto, which was uh, written just for him, and liked what he saw. Did a couple of screen tests for other actors that said, you know, Syl, you're my guy. So uh, we had Sylvester McCoy for three seasons. And but the rate, the problem is, that, but here's the thing. Then okay, so Saturday it wasn't working again. So they put it on back during the week. The problem is they put the show up against Coronation Street, which is the biggest rated soap opera in Britain. This would be like going up against 60 Minutes in the United States back in the 80s or something. You know, it was at its prime. I'm not sure. You know, I, I can't even think of what you could put up against now to be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so the ratings were going down, and they're going down, and they're going down, and there's nothing they could do. And it, the, finally, the BBC just said, OK, fine. Show's over. But they didn't actually say show's over. They just said, you yeah, know, we're, we're thinking about it. We're done. And then about a year later, maybe, and it just kept going and going fine. I think everyone realized there's no show, but it's there. It's done. Stick a fork in it. But there's you know major Doctor Who fans all over the world, and they're not gonna let the show die. And I believe someone here is gonna talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even though uh, the program went off the air in December of 1989, the flicker of fandom still kept the show alive. I mean, the production office did officially close in August of 90, but there is an expanded universe of Doctor Who beyond just television. Virgin Publications, a uh, book line in the UK, started a series of original adventures focusing on the seventh Doctor. This lasted about uh, 61 novels uh, over the course of several years and featured uh, new companions, uh, specifically for the Seventh Doctor. One of them continues to this day, uh, Professor Bernie Summerfield, an archaeologist from the 26th century. Hey, Bernie's fans! Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but they figure, but uh, there was such a fan outcry, it's like, okay, we've got these new adventures of the Seventh Doctor, what about the other incarnations? So, Virgin Publishing went, okay, we'll now do a missing adventures line. These Two are, Doctor Who books every month. It was only yes. yes. Uh, that one lasted a little bit shorter, only about uh, 30, uh, 30 novels. But these stories, these novels, 
fitted in between the televised stories. So there was a focus a bit on continuity. And uh, the Missing Adventures focused on Doctors 1 through 6. Uh, Marvel Comics also came out with a yearbook, a series of comics and short stories. Also during this time, uh, well, starting back in 1979, is the official Doctor Who magazine, Woo! which you can find in local retail outlets. And within this is articles about every episode, behind the scenes, font of knowledge, but it also maintained a continuing comics story. So 1979, Tom Baker was the uh, Doctor, so you had a comic storyline in addition to the TV stories. Now, Doctor Who and comics, going back further in time, actually started 1964 with the first Doctor in a series called TV Comic. So Doctor Who and comics have been going hand in hand since practically the beginning and still continues to this day in Doctor Who magazine and uh, there's a comic company out of San Diego, IDW Comics. They have a booth here at Comic-Con. You will see Doctor Who comics at their booth. Oh look, there's one now. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. So yes, uh, the, that's uh, Doctor Who in print. Also during what we call the wilderness years, when there was no nothing on TV. A bunch of uh, fans in England professionally produced some spin-off videos. The rights to the Doctor were not available, but the rights to certain characters and companions were. So, you have a three-part trilogy focusing on the Autons and certain secret uh, service members of UNIT. You've got a couple videos called Mind, uh, Mind Game and Mind Game Trilogy. Sophie Aldred reprising the role of Ace. But had uh, some Tarn and a uh, Draconian in there. Little vignette, short stories. There's a five-part video series called Probe. Taking on, uh, focuses on the character of Liz Shaw. Uh, she left UNIT, but she's investigating these odd happenings. It's kind of a BBC, uh, pseudo-BBC version of the X-Files. Uh, there was also a, a, a one, uh, one video called Downtime, which, which actually brought back Victoria Waterfield, Sarah Jane Smith, the Brigadier against the Great Intelligence, who we recently saw in the possible spoiler if you haven't seen it. Block your ears. Three, two, one. The recent Christmas special. Oh yeah, that was a good one. Oh yeah. So we've had the Virgin Adventures, the uh, Missing Adventures, the comics. Then in 1996, something happened on Fox Television. Dun dun dun. We had a TV movie. Sylvester McCoy reprised his role as the Seventh Doctor and regenerated into the Eighth, Paul McGann. Any Paul McGann fans? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Now granted, he's only had the one TV movie adventure, but it sparked a whole other slew of series. About this time, uh, BBC Books figured, oh, we want to get in on this novel thing. So Virgin lost their license, BBC Books picked it up whole new series of adventures focusing on the Eighth Doctor in novels, to the tune of about 73 of them. Start reading now. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, so past Doctor adventures focusing on Doctors 1 through 7, so there's uh, a whole slew of expanded universe items out there. Then in 1999, we've covered print, we've covered video. How about Doctor Who on audio? Woo! Eric mentioned that um, a lot of the episodes uh, of the first two Doctors, Hartnell and Troughton, they were wiped by the BBC for reasons too lengthy to get into. However, some intrepid fans got creative. While they were watching the story, they took their reel-to-reel -reel audio recorders, hardwired it into their TV so there's no ambient noise, the soundtracks of all episodes exist. They are being released by BBC Audio. And all the some, missing ones are already out. By the yes. Way, so, yeah. Some fans have put together what they call reconstructions because a um, bit of behind the scenes. Uh, there's a there's a photographer that took still photos so he can provide it to the directors as a reference for their work. These are called telesnaps. Some fans took these telesnaps, married them up with the audio track, so you have what's called a telesnap reconstruction. They're out there, check the internet. They are available, there's dub sites, they are good. Some people, uh, some of the, uh, these productions have incorporated some CGI work into them as well. Um, so we've got that. 
uh, that on audio. But in 1999, a company called Big Finish Productions. <laughs> ah, a subscriber. Because as you know, subscribers get more at bigfinish.com. <laughs> Big Finish started the Doctor Who Adventures on audio. The very first release is called The Sirens of Time with Doctors 5, 6, and 7. So it was a big event. These monthly releases continue to this day, despite the fact that there's a new series on television. We are currently, uh, this month is issue number 170. That's just the monthly range. Start listening, folks. There's a whole slew of spin-off audios. Uh, Dalek Empire, focusing on, I think you can guess, uh, another series called Cybermen, one focusing on Unit, two series worth of the Sarah Jane Adventures before there was even a Sarah Jane Adventures on television. And these are featuring the original actors, both doctors and companions. New companions have been introduced into the storyline as well. These audios fit between the audio adventures and the previously published novels. So there's a whole expanded universe of Doctor Who out there awaiting you, just beyond television. Um, uh, what else? Oh yeah, uh, there have been some big guest actors in this audio series. Anybody familiar with David Warner? Sir Derek yes. Jacobi? Yes. And before he was even the Doctor, a certain David Tennant was starring in these Big Finish audios. So check them out, bigfinish.com. Subscribers get more. Oh yes. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the expanded universe. Then something fantastic happened well, in the spring they... of 2005. Well, yeah. Let me, let me backtrack a little, if I may. The uh, the whole Paul McGann movie was done in cooperation with Fox and Universal. So let's just say the rights to Doctor Who were kind of tangled up in a wibbly wobbly spaghetti ball of mess. Um, for the 40th anniversary in 2003, however, uh, BBC Interactive, BBC's website, thought, hey, could we do a Doctor Who story? So they came out, so they looked, at, investigated doing a story, and it did come out called Scream of the Shalka, and I actually got a little Scream of the Shalka news, believe it or not, to tell you later. But, um, in the course of that, they were investigating the rights about the show, and they found that, wait, no, the BBC hasn't given up any rights to Doctor Who. We've got all the characters, we've got everything. The only thing that... Fox and Universal have to deal with are the other the new characters created for the TV movie, which is why you will never see. Um, well, I can't remember any Daphne Asbrook's character. Grace, Grace thank Holloway. you, but you'll never see Grace appear in Doctor Who again, most likely, or Chang Lee, or Eric Roberts' incarnation of the Master, because those rights are tied up with other people. But they have been involved with Big Finish audios. This is true. <laughs> But, um, so the BBC said, wait, we can make Doctor Who again? You know, we kind of miss that show, don't we? Um, and so, the, one of the, I think, was it Tran Jane Trander, was it? Took a, took a chance and said, let's do Doctor Who again. And they convinced uh, Russell T. Davis, big name, well-known, well-respected TV creator in Britain, to be behind it. Well, of course, he's a Doctor Who fan. He's a big Doctor Who fan. So he said, yeah, I'll do it. Um, and they, well, I mean, I think you got, most of you probably see what happened from there. But, uh, yeah. but here's the thing, when the, so spring 2005, they finally started up Doctor Who again for the first time as a regular TV production in 16 years. And they were scared to death. They had no idea what was going to happen. Would this work? Would, he, would a new generation of fans who hadn't even grown up with the show watch the show and understand it and, be, and like it? Um, let's just say the numbers were phenomenal. <laughs> Still are. Well, yeah, but no, it's, it's just, it's so much a part of British culture that they, it was, I think it was a case of everyone looking around saying, what were we afraid of? But at the time, you know, it's like all of a sudden, like after that first episode aired, they said, "Okay, we're doing a second season. We're commissioning that now." By the time the season was over, they said, "Okay, third season, go." <laughs> um, so uh, all of a sudden, Doctor Who has a few, not only does it have a future, it's uh, it's as big or bigger than it's ever been. It's just I'm as I can't speak for these two guys, but as a long-term fan, I'm thinking. 
wait, hold on, there, Doctor Who's being spoofed on American TV shows? They're coming over here to debut episodes, they're shooting, they're making episodes in America, and around the world, other parts around the world, it's like, and it's like, there's all this stuff in the shops in Britain, there's all this stuff in the shops in America? Whoa, wait a minute, what happened? <laughs> This little show I liked, it's like the small number of fans who are all waiting patiently for it to return its return. And it's a monster. <laughs> when did we become mainstream? <laughs> Do we like that? Oh yeah. I like it. So hey, how many Doctor Who fans here? Raise your hand. <laughs> a few years ago at a con like this, we might have gotten a little tiny room and we might have gotten a half the room filled. I mean, seriously, this is how big it's gotten. Uh, here's the amazing part, though. Thanks to, because of changes in technology and just people realizing, oh, wait, why are we waiting? We used, uh, I remember when Colin Baker started as the doctor, we got, we were getting flicker vision co copies, they're called, because people would actually point a camera at the TV in Britain, and you would get, and send the tapes by snail mail to the United States, and then people would them and send them out. And, but because of the different video standards, there's all these black bars that would fly up and down across the screen. Um, things got better, but now, let's just say, we're getting Doctor Who the very same day it's shown in Britain. And so is Canada. And not only that, they, and then the Australians and New Zealanders are getting it the next day. But here's the bizarre part. They've just announced that not only are the United States and Canada getting it the same day, not only are Australia and New Zealand getting it the next day, but the next day also is now being shown in South Africa, which is one of the few English-speaking countries where it hasn't been made before, and here's the most bizarre part, Poland. <laughs> I don't know if they're dubbing it into Polish all that quickly, or if they're getting subtitles, or if they're just watching it in English and going, I don't know what's going, what they're saying, but I love what, how it looks. <laughs> For those of you in the back, there are empty seats up here. Please, don't be a stranger. Yes, we have room. Yes, there is room up front. So, and I think that's a good time to open it up to Q&A from the audience. Yes, now before you ask any Qs and we give any As, I just want to point out, we are not from the BBC. We do not represent BBC America. We do not purport to represent any licensees or other holders of anything having to do with Doctor Who. We are just long-term, well-connected, and very knowledgeable fans. So. I'll be honest with you, if we don't know, I will tell you, hey, we don't know. Uh, the show's coming back in a month, by the way. Uh, yes. March 30th. Uh, 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 I happen to have some of that latest oh. information. Right. <laughs> this is all the easy press release stuff, so it's not Yeah, really all right, so here's what we know about this. So this, is, here's, this is the second half of the seventh series. Or as us long-term fans call it, is it season 33 now? Like that, yeah. 34. 34, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, uh, they, the debut is March 30th, Easter weekend. So, uh, and that first episode is called The Bells of St. John. It is an urban thriller, they call it. It's set, being set in contemporary London, and the publicity photo has the Doctor and Clara on a motorbike crashing through the Shard, which is this big new iconic tower that's been built in London. It's not the Gherkin, is it? Pardon? the Gherkin or something? Maybe it's the Gherkin, I don't know. It is the Gherkin. No, the Gherkin, all right. So they're, look, they're crashing through a big plate glass window, okay? That's all we need to know. Um, it was written by Stephen Moffat. It's directed by Cole McCarthy. And uh, here's the tagline, there is something in the Wi-Fi. <laughs> Plus, <Office. laughs> we're being introduced to a new villain called the Spoonheads. <laughs> seriously? Uh, seriously, I think Spoonheads may be a placeholder name. We'll actually find out what they're called in the episode itself. That's my... Oh, well, the Kardashians are back. Okay. <laughs> okay, that's Star Trek, sorry. <laughs> Alright, so anyway, now, after that, we, episode after that, uh, has been planned. It is written by Neil Cross and directed by Farron Blackburn. That's all I know about. Neil Cross is the guy who does Luther with Eagles Elf. Have you yeah. seen that? Oh, no, was he involved in Spooks, too? Someone, someone was involved in Spooks, one of the writers, yeah. Anyway. Um, then the next episode also doesn't have any, but it was written. Yes, it does now? Yeah. You're ahead of me. What's the name of that next episode? The Cold War. Ooh, the Cold War. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. Uh, that one that was written 
by Mark Gatiss, who wrote, what is it? Which one's it? Sherlock. Well, Sherlock, yeah. Good point, Ted. Yeah, quite right. He wrote, yeah, Real quite the right. Yeah, he wrote a play, Professor Lazarus and the Lazarus Experiment. So, wrote several of those virgin new adventures I talked about. That's true, he did. Um, this one takes place on a Russian submarine during the Cold War. And, oh, and there's a monster on it called the Ice Warriors. Any of you are back. They are back, yes. Uh, the, well, the publicity photo they had for the Bells of St. John is very unclear, but there is some sort of shadow of an Ice Warrior on it, and it looks, two of them, right, and it looks like they're pretty much like they used to look, but they've been, you know, like all the other monsters that have come back, they've been tweaked a little, just a little, but you can definitely tell they're Ice Warriors. All right, after that, this one we do have a name for, The Phantom of the Hex, by Neil Cross, directed by Jamie Payne. Uh, we, do, we don't know much about it, except it does star Doug Ray Scott and Jessica Rain, if you know. Jessica Rain's in Call of Midwife, and she will also be turning up in, in Adventures in Time and Space, which will, Space and Time. Right, which we will talk about. Oh. Yes. After that is a story with no name yet, but this one's also written by Mark Gatiss. And it's directed by Saul Metstein, who's done some of the biggest, most weirdly iconic stories over the last few years. Um, this is going to be an exciting one, because first of all, it's Victor it takes place in the Victorian era. Well, about half the Doctor Who stories take place in the Victorian era. Yeah, guess who the guest stars are? Dame Diana Rigg and her daughter Rachel Sterling, playing mother and daughter, no less. <laughs> Not only appearing in, or will they be appearing, but also Neve McIntosh will be back as Bostra. Uh, like, uh, Cap Catherine Stewart is back as Jenny, and of course, Dan Starkey is back as everyone's favorite potato head is Sontar and Strax! <laughs> 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 you thought that was big? What about the penultimate episode of the season? Uh, when he won, when he won, was it, one of his awards, he won several awards, Neil Gaiman, right. when he won, got an award for The Doctor's Wife, he said, you would have to be crazy or insane to do that again. I'm on my third draft already. <laughs> it's called The Last Cyberman. Ooh. Who's the villain? <laughs> <laughs> the Barsons. Anyway, uh, sweet! Um, it's directed by Stephen Wolfenden. I think, believe he's new. And two of the guest stars in this episode are David Warner, and Warwick Davis. Oh. Warwick Davis is finally doing Doctor Who. I'm a happy fan. And then we have the, fin the season finale. We don't know much about it at all. We have no name. We do know Stephen Moffat's writing it. We know Saul Medstein's uh, directing it. Um, two things also about the season that are circulating in the rumor verse. So if Ryan, if you have that sign that you had once, you know, fact, rumor, oh, hold up the rumor one, one, right? Rumor. All right. First of all, apparently, uh, in by the end of the season, we will find out the Doctor's deepest, darkest secret. Uh, <laughs> and the other rumor is there may be Zygons in the season somewhere. We don't know what. We don't know if this is true. We don't know if it's going to happen, but I, th I think the Zygons are probably the next beast that should be come back from the, the break, you guys? Oh, no? yeah. Yeah, they're yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. I, I messed up my research. One of these episodes, I can't remember which one now. I'm sorry. I messed up. But I will tell you this. One of the titles that I forgot, Journey to the Heart of the TARDIS, oh. or Journey to the Center of the, something like that. It's Journey to the Center of the TARDIS. That's the one, yes. Yes, they're gonna. We're That's gonna what it says the, on the team. Yeah, exactly. We're gonna see what's in the TARDIS. So, yeah. then, now here's what we know is coming up after the season is over. That's gonna end mid-May, first part of June, somewhere in there. Here's two things we do know for sure will happen. One, as uh, Ryan mentioned earlier, they are making an anniversary docudrama about the early days of Doctor Who, called Adventure in Space and Time. David Bradley, who was Filch in the Harry Potter movies, is playing William Hartnell. And he was in Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. And he was Solomon in Dinosaurs on a Spaceship, right? Um, and he's in Game of Thrones, right? I mean, you know, this is the big thing. And the, the few pictures I've leaked out so far, oh my goodness, he looks the part. 
the other actors they've cast, oh my goodness, they look just right. This is... Not only is the telefilm focusing on the origins of Doctor Who, but covers the entire Hartnell era up to the regeneration. So we're going to see a lot of iconic moments reproduced in color, such as Daleks crossing Westminster Bridge. This is written by Mark Eaves. He's a super fan. Oh, good, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the latest word that's come out, they're wrapping up filming now, and apparently people are talking about being uh, menaced by bee people, so apparently we're going to see behind the scenes of filming the wet planet. Um, then, here's the only other thing we know for sure, well, two things we know for sure. One, there will be an anniversary special that takes place within Doctor Who continuity. It will be a story. Uh, it's going to be at least an hour long, a lot of people saying 90 minutes, I'm kind of over. Hours. We'll I'm hoping for a mini series. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I will get to that. And then we do know there will be, here's a shocker, another Christmas special. After like two years, all of a sudden it's become, it's like, oh, we gotta have a Doctor Who Christmas. There's always a Doctor Who Christmas special. Well, some of us remember like, oh, the 20th century when there wasn't. But that's another <laughs> Now, uh, some people, some fans have complained, what? What? It's the 50th anniversary and that's all you're going to do? The response from the BBC has basically said, that's only the tip of the iceberg. We're not going to tell you what else is coming up yet. So it's like, oh. <laughs> and season eight is for. And, yeah, and the, yeah, and then the show is going to continue for, you know. It, it, is, it is so big in the rating that it's you know, consistently in the top ten every week. Which it never, almost never did in the old days, back, you know, in okay, five minute signal, five minute warning. The, um, it's it's going to go on. So we got the five minute signal. I think we should open the floor up. So, real quick, yes? All right, uh, the new series and stuff, where the heck do the Daleks keep coming from? Because I swear to God, every three episodes, it's like, this is the final Dalek. <laughs> they always come back. That's what he says. They always come back. I know, but they keep saying there are no more in the universe. I've killed all but they this guy. They... It's a time warp. Come on, you can go back and fix things. Okay. Right. Everybody repeat. Wibbly wobbly. Time wobbly. You can the microphone. Yeah, as a viewer fan, where is the best source to see as much of this? Where's Does iTunes like, have a classic? Apparently, a place called Netflix. <laughs> KBTC, are, do you get to, do you get, are you local? Do you get local TV? I don't. I don't get the internet. Okay, Netflix, KBTC, libraries have DVD. Oh, I got DVD news real quick. I'm going to zip through this if I could, by the way. Okay. The, DVDs, uh, the DVD release schedule has been announced for the rest of the year. These are British dates. The American ones are usually right after. So, coming up, um, as uh, this month, the Aztec Special Edition with the episode of Galaxy 4 that was discovered recently. Um, in May, the Visitation Special Edition, Inferno Special Edition. Now it gets exciting. In June, The Mind of Evil. This has been in black and white for a long, long time. They finally got it recolored. They managed to uh, reprocess the color, and then when they couldn't, they got fanned and put the color in. It worked out great. And the final Tom Baker story, Terror of the Zygons. Yes. Um, Coming out in August, special edition of the Green Death and the Ice Warriors, the Patrick Troughton story, with the two missing episodes, like they did with the Invasion and like they've done with the Ring of Terror, are going to be animated. Um, Scream of the Shalka, the, the uh, webcast story I told you about. After 10 years, it's coming out on DVD. Uh, and then in November, for the anniversary, The Tenth Planet. That is the last William Hartnell story where he regenerates. One episode is missing, they're going to animate that one too. And that will be the last episode of Doctor Who that the BBC holds that will be released. Except big question mark on Underwater Man 2, which was recently found, I suspect there will be an extra on one of those. So, question? It's always been their goal to have all episodes of Doctor Who available on DVD by November 23rd this year. Oh, also this summer on Blu-ray. Yes. John Pertwee's first story, Spearhead from Space. Why this story? It's all on film. So, I totally had this dream last night where all the doctors got a message from the TARDIS and they all came to the same point in time everywhere to solve some big, huge thing. It was an amazing dream. Um, <laughs> Did you record it? <laughs> Does Stephen Moffat know? <laughs> he has a hit on you now. <laughs> 
question is, is there any talk somewhere in the cosmos of, like other than that one Christmas special where um, the two doctors came together, I can't even remember the name of the, the next doctor. doctor. <laughs> Time crash. Time crash, Time yes. Crash. yes. Is there any talk of more than one doctor being in the same point in time? Here's the deal. We do not, at this stage, we do not know what is going to be in the anniversary special. However, I know. Okay, let me, this will be the last thing I say, then we got to get out of here. So here's the deal. Apparently, Louise Jameson was told recently, um, could you keep make sure these dates are cleared? We might want you for something then. And John Barrowman, just this morning on British television, he has been saying up to this point, I don't know anything about the 50th anniversary. I don't know what's going on, but I want to be in it. Today, he's changed his tune. He said, Dave, we started talking. Yeah. So we will see what happens. They finished doing a, a big multi doctor story right. with Tom Baker, Peter Davison, Colin Baker, Celeste McCoy, and Paul McCann. We would love to keep answering your questions. We can talk about it. See us out in the hall. Yeah. We'll be out in the hall, yeah. Thanks for coming.